Evensong is the main service of the Abbey Day at Westminster, and half the afternoon is spent preparing for it. Some boys solemn, some carefree, some with hair that won't lie down. Invisible to the eyes of grown-ups, there will be a small society here, with its heroes and villains, and all the fearful hierarchy of boyhood. Good afternoon, boys. Martin Neary is the organist and master of the choristers. Mary look first at the Hulls Westminster service, which is the setting for this evening. I'm going to ask a junior boy to clap me the rhythm on the first line into the second line. I'll play the piano part to start with, and then who's going to offer to do it? One, yeah, sure. Two. Okay, no problem. Upstairs, the lay vicars wait their turn to practice. It's not all darts and descants, though, as most have other jobs, though they're all, oddly, members of Actors' Equity. What <laughs> <laughs> if you're having practice shots? <laughs> Almost too sharp, didn't you, on that last note? But that was uh, carefully done, those semitones. Now, shall we see if we can have an arpeggio to expand our sound? A big crescendo through. No. No. Shall we get the quick history of Henry VIII out of the way? The best way to remember Henry VIII is divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. Henry changed the religion to Protestant. When Mary, we became Catholics again, and many people lost again. Now they're all getting divorced. We're going to have to invent a new state ceremony for divorce. So he was very concerned about the matter. And at the same time, we have Anne Boleyn coming to the scene, a very uh, young, beautiful woman that was brought up in the last few years of her life in the court of France. And um, it was a great blessing when she caught this illness in 1558. And never survived. So that, of course, brought Henry VIII's second daughter, Elizabeth I, to the throne. Now you're going to see this lovely, beautiful tomb of Elizabeth I, wearing her crown, her chain of office, holding her sepulcher and all. There's an almost unbroken tradition of magnanimity about the Abbey. Macaulay called it a temple of silence and reconciliation. And here repeatedly are found antagonisms laid to rest and enemies reconciled in death. This is the tomb of Elizabeth I. In old age, looking not unlike a Jacob's sheep. She was the daughter of Henry VIII. And long years ago, when she was a girl, had been held captive and threatened with execution by her half-sister, Queen Mary, the elder daughter of Henry VIII. Mary a Catholic, Elizabeth a Protestant. Mary has no effigy, and for many years she had no grave, a coffin just left, covered with the broken stones from the altars that the Protestants had demolished. She was very unpopular, and at her funeral in this chapel, the congregation is said to have torn down the hangings from the walls in a frenzy of joy. Now her coffin lies in the vault below, with Elizabeth firmly on top of it. The inscription on the tomb reads, Partners both in throne and grave, here rest we, two sisters, Elizabeth and Mary, in the hope of one resurrection. In the corresponding position to Elizabeth on the other side of the Lady Chapel is the tomb of Mary, Queen of Scots, whom Elizabeth had executed.
Mary Queen of Scots was the mother of James I and when he came to the throne he had her body brought here and erected this splendid tomb making sure she was as honoured in the grave as was her executioner. Elizabeth always pretended that she hadn't intended to execute Mary but the men who did her dirty work are here in the Abbey too. This is Sir Thomas Bromley, the judge who tried and sentenced the Scottish Queen. Someone else implicated was Sir John Puckering, but he was able to blame his secretary, who having no powerful friends, was the one who went to prison. Shoddy behaviour by the establishment all round. So what's new? James I left the tombs of his mother's executioners undisturbed. Unlike Charles II, who rooted out Cromwell and anybody who had to do with his father's death. But such vindictiveness, the Abbey run on political lines, never occurred again. So Pitt is here with Fox, their differences, like those of Gladstone and Israeli, as much temperament as a politics like the lion and the unicorn embodying different sides of the English character. But perhaps the most magnanimous gesture of all is that here in the Abbey is the tomb of Charles Darwin, the bogey of so many Victorian clergymen, yet buried here and at the Abbey's request. He wrote works on philosophy, mathematics, optics and even on theology. And here on his monument, we see Newton reclining against his books. Personally, I think it's rather sad that the one thing not shown on this monument is that famous apple that played such an important part in his understanding of gravity. <laughs> Up a bit. Down a bit. Oh! Nobody gets behind that bottom line. Two. The chandeliers in the Abbey were given by the Guinness family to replace the old electroliers, which to me had more character. These have a hint of perspex and don't quite escape the function room. If it's not necessary to change, it's necessary not to change. The pillars here are so ridged and grooved, it's as if history itself had creaked its glacial way down the nave, though the scars were actually made by scaffolding from centuries of coronations. There's a hand, there's a hand Parts of the fabric, though, are so worn they can't be touched. The brasses, for instance. And at the brass rubbing centre in the cloisters, they have to make do with replicas. The Abbey's greatest and most mysterious treasure is so fragile and precious, it must always be kept covered up. But today, it's briefly on view. This is the 13th century Cosmati pavement, laid down before the high altar when the abbey was built, and on the central boss of which the chair of state stands at the coronation. Set in Purbeck marble, it's made of porphyry, onyx, marble and glass, and once carried long inscriptions inlaid in bronze, though what they meant is still the subject of conjecture. Apart from the big one in the um, I don't yeah, think I so. I don't. I don't think so. I think there's only the big one. Yeah. Um, 
Yes, I don't. I don't think there is another one at yeah. all. I'm not sure whether there might be a slide. Yeah. There may well be one amongst, you know, a, yeah. a, a selection yeah. of slides, but I'm yeah. not sure. Have you been into the bookshop? No, no. It looks so much like a maze. You half expect the legend, "Ye started here," but it's not a maze, but seemingly a model of man's place in the universe and the nature of time. At the heart of the abbey, it is a profound mystery. Marvell, the poet of Hull, who was not buried in the abbey, wrote, The grave's a fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. But it's not entirely true, as Dean Stanley, in the 19th century, poignantly found. In the vault beneath this stone lies George II, the last Hanoverian king to be buried in the abbey. The others are at Windsor. His wife, Caroline of Anspach, died over 20 years before, and although the king had been consistently unfaithful to her, she'd been his closest friend and companion. So that when he died, he left instructions they should lie side by side. Hunting through the vaults for the body of James I, Dean Stanley broke into George II's vault and there were the coffins of the King and the Queen, side by side, and a board had been withdrawn from each of the coffins, so that their dust did indeed mingle. And the two boards were still leant against the wall of the vault, where they'd been left more than a century before. Perhaps I could bring you down by the altar. Marvel apart, Hull's other poet is Philip Larkin who wrote a poem about an effigy in Chichester Cathedral where a knight had withdrawn his hand from his gauntlet in order to clasp the hand of his wife. That turned out to be a bit of sentimental 19th century restoration, but it need not have been. Richard II, who lies here, was so frantic with grief on the death of his first wife, Anne of Bohemia, that when he ordered their tomb, he had them laid beside one another with their hands firmly clasped. And had a thief not hacked off the hands, Larkin's poem, which was not appropriate at Chichester, would have been appropriate here. What will survive of us is love. Some marriages, though, don't survive the grave. Thomas Sissel ordered a triple tomb for himself and his two wives and this is wife number one. Wife number two married him when she was really only a girl and he was already old and gouty and pretty disgusting but she stayed married to him for 12 years before he died and she obviously decided that dead or alive she didn't want to sleep with him a moment longer than she needed to so when she died aged 83 she made sure she got a tomb to herself in Winchester Cathedral leaving her place beside him empty.
This probably is the most amazing creation of the early 16th century. In Britain there are three or four great masterpieces of late Gothic art and this is one of them. King's College Chapel, Cambridge of course is well known, St George's Chapel, Windsor. But the structural virtuosity of this one is amazing. And then underneath, to reduce the weight when the whole thing is dropped into position, you've got the, this decoration scooped out to lighten it. And that sort of structural tension is really emphasized by these great pendants, bosses which hang down. They're in reality about six feet. They're about life size when you get up there, 80 feet in the air. Those add on an extra half ton or so of weight, which further pulls down like enormous superimposed weights or sort of dangling underneath. Uh, the weight comes right through the stones on top and tightens up these arches further so that the whole thing is even further tightened and made tense. And it's a wonderful thing that the structure sort of as you see it visually with its decoration as well sort of expresses the structural truth. An astonishing piece of masonry virtuosity. The monks when they came for long nights of prayer stood like this but their arms on these shelves as you like to call them and then when they got very tired the seat came down and you'll find under the seat are some beautiful wood carvings and several books been written on them here briefly was buried oliver cromwell cromwell gets unfairly blamed not only for the destruction and iconoclasm of the 17th century but of the 16th century too simply because he shares a surname with thomas cromwell the secretary of Henry VIII, who presided over the dissolution of the monasteries. It's true that Cromwell helped to execute Charles I, but like many revolutionaries, he grew much more conservative as he grew older, and actually treated the abbey very well, and chose to be buried here in a spot that was originally reserved for Henry VI. Many of the other regicides were buried here too. Come the restoration, Charles II rooted, it, rooted them all out and had the bodies taken to Tyburn and, rather futilely, beheaded. They were then thrown in a common pit over by St Margaret. It's a disreputable episode and there were many people at the time, including Samuel Pepys, who were uneasy about it. And it's a departure from the consistent magnanimity that normally attaches to burial in the Abbey. Once you're here, you stay here. The two children that left us down here are children of relations of royal families, which is why they're up this far part of the church. This is a statue that will be based. No peaking, no peaking. That's what we quickly can get him out, the little slurps, you see, right? Now, ladies and gentlemen, have I got, or should I say ladies, have I got an honest lady who will own up to being five foot one, or as close as possible to five one? And of course, I always like to end my tour with that very famous man who asked to be buried in Poets' Corner and not Musical Isle. And that, of course, is the very famous George Frederick Handel, who gave us that lovely Messiah, the Hallelujah Chorus, and that lovely um, thing sung by Jenny Lynn so long after his death, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Even song in the offing now, so the last visitors troop out. Back to their buses, their hotels in Bayswater, and a chance to put their feet up before they go off to Cats or the Phantom. Not quite as long running as Westminster Abbey, but still all part of the heritage. The choir waits by the coffee stall in the cloisters, ready to make their entrance. A nice moment someone wants to capture on film, so Frank the Verger obliges.
This is something we saw them doing in the afternoon. They dress up for a kind of service. Nice they still keep it up. Lovely colours. Shown round by one of the clergy before we started these programmes, I saw that he bowed to the altar, as I used to do when I was a boy and very devout. I don't do it now because it would lay claim to a piety I don't feel. But not doing it feels wrong too, as it seems to assert an indifferent atheism I don't feel either. I was always taught to kneel and say a prayer when I came into a church, I don't do that fearful, I suppose, of being observed, or less fearful of being observed by the Almighty. Of course, a fervent Anglican is almost a contradiction in terms. Someone once said that the Anglican Church is so constituted that its members can really believe anything, but of course almost none of them do. I remember the early morning services old ladies rigid with arthritis who could yet sink gracefully to one knee at the mention of the Virgin's name. The lilies on the altar at the great festivals and the solemn mounting ritual of the communion service. You sit, says the priest, when once upon a time one would have needed no telling, but knelt and rose and sat and stood and prayed and sung and answered according to the stern and intricate choreography of the prayer book.
I used to know large chunks of the prayer book by heart, but that's of course not much use these days. To go into a church knowing the Book of Common Prayer is about as useful as going into a disco knowing how to dance the Belita. So I flounder through the service, stumbling over the bits that have been missed out, saying the wrong words where they've been rewritten conscripted into the ranks of the unworshipping multitude whom as a boy I used to despise for not knowing the drill. One of those unaccustomed worshippers whom when I spotted them in difficulties I used to hand my prayer book open at the place with a kindly smile. Me now. But if I love the prayer book, I seldom come to church. So who am I to take sides? For the clergy, it's a working text. And if I loathe what's been done to the prayer book, I loathe fanaticism more. And many of the supporters of the old prayer book are or are allied with fanatics. This great building is a monument to tolerance and magnanimity. And I value that more than a text. Even a text as imbued with history as the comfortable words of the prayer book. Cranmer, who preached from that pulpit, was one of the architects of the prayer book and was burnt at the stake. But he didn't die for English prose. Doors closed at last, and the statues breathe a sigh of relief. If I'd known it was going to be as busy as this, I'd never have been buried here in the first place. A chance now to really rest in peace, with only the organ scholar Louise Marsh doing her practice.
For all that we're in the middle of a cemetery, strolling through some of its 3,000 odd graves, there isn't much sense of the presence of death. And not even at night is it in the least bit eerie. It's partly that death is not graphically presented. There are none of those cadaver tombs with the deceased on the upper story in his or her prime and on the lower the decaying corpse. It's as if, having secured a niche in this illustrious place, the dead have dressed up for the occasion, been laid out in their best, surrounded by their children and dependents. Or as time goes on, they're seen at some great climactic point in their lives, like General Wolfe, struck down on the heights of Abraham at his moment of triumph. There's really only one monument where death comes into its own, and it's the last work of the sculptor Rubiliac. Lady Elizabeth Nightingale died in premature childbirth, brought on by a thunderstorm. And death is represented as bursting through the iron doors of life to hurl his dart at her. And so hastily as he seized it up that he holds it by the feathers. It's a curious monument because the nightingales have fallen into rather stagey postures and it's death who's full of life and vitality. The story is told that a thief broke into the abbey one night and caught sight of death in the moonlight and fled leaving his crowbar behind him. And they still kept the crowbar till the end of the 19th century. But to be fair, it's the kind of story that's often told to authenticate the power of the illusion of art. Tonight, the Dean, Michael Mayne, is taking some friends round. One of his 19th century predecessors, Dean Buckland, never showed anybody over the Abbey without taking with him a feather duster, flicking the tombs as he told their history. And his body was brought here several years later, and they lie together in that tomb. Now, behind me is the coronation chair, and that was made for Edward I in 1292, and it contains the very ancient stone of Scone. It's a stone that originally came from Ireland, where uh, kings were crowned on it, and also then went to Scotland, where the kings were crowned. And it was stolen by Edward I from Scotland and brought here, and he had the chair made in order to contain it. And it's remained here ever since, until Christmas Day 1950, when very dramatically, three Scottish nationalists got into the abbey, hid on Christmas Eve, and in the small hours, they'd parked an old Ford car outside Poets Corner entrance. They got the stone on a tarpaulin, they took it down the steps, a, a bit of it broke off, and they managed to get it into the car. They'd got most of it into the car, two of them were sitting in the car with it when a policeman arrived. <laughs> And uh, he took his helmet off and put it on the car, and he took off a cigarette, took out a cigarette and started to smoke it. And the two of them got into the car and went into a clinch, the man and the woman. And he started talking to them, and they looked up, and the third man, who got the other bit of the stone, was just appearing round the door, and <laughs> saw this and froze and disappeared. And they then had to drive off, and there's an extraordinary story. They, they had it for four months, they got away with it, and they finally left it in Arbroath Abbey, where it was recovered and brought back. And the man who was behind it is now a very distinguished Scottish advocate. <laughs> so there are the Plantagenets, there's the coronation chair. If we just move over across to um, Edward III's tomb, and as you go, look back, because here you'll see the shrine has been built. 
uh, so that there are these kneeling spaces along the side where the sick people used to go and pray for healing because one has to remember in the Middle Ages this was a great um, center of pilgrimage uh, like St. Thomas's Shrine at Canterbury, the Shrine of Edward here at Westminster uh, was enormously popular and pilgrims would have come and prayed for healing uh, at the Shrine. Now just turning to Edward III, this is a lovely effigy uh, of this sad old man who had a stroke just before he died and you can see from the top the corner of his mouth is turned down and it's strangely a lot of damage has been done to the abbey both at the reformation and during the commonwealth and things have been stolen and all the little figures on the tombs many of them have been stolen or damaged but not on this one the the angels are still here if you can see in these little niches whereas they're not uh, in the other ones and the other side there are some lovely figures of his children little bronze statues of his of his children and then from here you get a good view of the chantry which was erected at the end of With huge wax tapers burning round the tombs and full of the murmur of masses for the dead, the medieval abbey at night must have been extraordinary. Here, the south transept, what's now Poets' Corner, would be thronged with monks hurrying through to their devotions in the choir. Before the dissolution, some of them, like present-day musicians, were putting in depths to say the service for them. But for all that, it must have remained a vast powerhouse of light and prayer and praise, like a great ship of faith voyaging through the night. This is when there's a coronation, they build out the whole stage here and bring the coronation chair to the center uh, and place it here. It's a very special place for those of us who live and work and worship at the Abbey. Uh, although it's a very, very busy building with these teeming crowds all the time, thousands every day, uh, it is, of course, basically a place of worship, and every day for us, uh, the day begins with silence, a corporate silence, in this lovely medieval chapel of St. Faith, and in the early morning. And it's a very special place. It's the sort of place which I think is impregnated with prayer, and you can feel it. Uh, the uh, monks of the 13th century um, painted uh, St. Faith, uh, who was a very popular medieval saint, and who was supposed to be um, burnt alive on a gridiron, roasted, and so she's ha holding her gridiron in one hand, which isn't so nice. Uh, there's a little monk, maybe the artist even, uh, just over on the left there, you can see, kneeling. And then in the center, a very lovely, simple uh, crucifixion uh, with Jesus and Mary and John in the center. And the colors, I think, are wonderful. But it's a very still place, this, and really a very simple chapel, and it's a good thick door, thick walls, and it's always quiet, however noisy the abbey is. It's always pretty silent in here. And uh, later this evening, the scholars from Westminster School will be coming here to sing Compline, which they do each week in turn. Um, the behind us, uh, up there, that sort of walkway is it leads from what used to be the monks' dormitory through to the abbey and they would have come through their night for their night office and they would have come down the steps outside into the choir. Joseph Addison, who was buried in the Lady Chapel, called Westminster this great magazine of mortality and wrote that the solemnity of the building and the condition of the people who lie in it fill the mind with a kind of melancholy or other thoughtfulness that is not disagreeable. When I see kings, wrote Addison, lying by those who deposed them, rival wits placed side by side, 
or the holy men that divided the world with their contests and disputes. I reflect with sorrow and astonishment on the little competitions, factions and debates of mankind. And when I read the several dates of the tombs of some that died yesterday and some 600 years ago, I consider that great day when we shall all of us be contemporaries and make our appearance together. So now, this is the Jerusalem chamber, which is quite a room. It was, in fact, built uh, as part of the abbot's lodging, because when it was a monastery, the whole of the courtyard out here and the rooms around it and our present deanery were part of the abbot's house. And it was built in the 1380s. So it's a 14th century room with a 14th century ceiling. And if you look at the ceiling, you'll see that the R with the crown above it is for Richard II, who was on the throne. And next to it, there's an NL with an abbot's mitre above it. And that was Nicholas Littlington, who was abbot at the time. The tapestries are mostly 16th century. They used to be most of them around the high altar in the abbey. They were brought in here when the room was reordered uh, by Dean Stanley, uh, who was Queen Victoria's dean, and he uncovered the ceiling. It was covered, that ceiling, with a false ceiling, and he took that down and, and revealed it. All sorts of extraordinary events have happened in here. The authorized version of the Bible, the King James Version, was translated in here, and every major translation since has been worked on in this room. The fireplace, which is interesting, was put up by Dean John Williams, who was Dean to Charles I, in order to celebrate the betrothal of King Charles and Henrietta Maria of France, which was agreed at a great banquet in this room, and there are little um, faces, caricature faces almost, of uh, Henrietta Maria and King Charles across the front. Uh, but the most uh, famous thing, I suppose, that happened in this room was that in uh, 1413, King Henry IV suffered from leprosy and was in great pain and bent almost double, was determined to go to the Holy Land on pilgrimage. And he came to the abbey and he prayed in that shrine that we've just been in of St. Edward. And when he was in the shrine, he was taken ill and he collapsed. And they thought he was dying. And they carried him down through the cloisters because the nave wasn't then complete. And they brought him in to the abbot's withdrawing room, which was this room called Jerusalem. It had been predicted that he would die in Jerusalem. And he recovered consciousness, the story is, and asked where he was. And he was told he was in Jerusalem, because this has always been called Jerusalem Room. And Shakespeare actually sets um, uh, a scene in Henry IV, Part Two in this room of the king's death. And by chance, <laughs> I got a copy of, of, of Shakespeare's Henry IV. And I want to just read you those last lines from that particular scene. King Henry says, Doth any name particular belong unto the lodging where I first did swoon? And Warwick says, Tis called Jerusalem, my noble lord, the king. Lord be to God, even there my life must end. It hath been prophesied to me many years, I should not die but in Jerusalem, which vainly I suppose the Holy Land. But bear me to that chamber, there I'll lie. In that Jerusalem shall Harry die. Now at nine o'clock come the Queen's scholars to say the last service of the day, Compline, in St. Faith's Chapel. And treading the same route across the south transept as once the monks did. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. Amen. Brethren, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Let us pray. Visit, we beseech thee, O Lord, this place, and drive far from it all the snares of the enemy, 
Let thy holy angels dwell herein to preserve us in peace, and may thy blessing be upon us evermore, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Light in our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. I will lay me down in peace and take my rest, for it is thou, Lord, only that makest me dwell in safety. The Lord be with you. God the Father bless us, God the Son defend us, God the Holy Ghost preserve us, and grant unto us, with all his faithful servants, living and departed, rest and peace. Amen. In the 19th century, Dean Stanley wrote that Westminster Abbey was a mirror of England. He meant in its splendour and ceremony. And in these egalitarian days, that sounds a touch grandiose and rhetorical. But if we reflect that this unique place and its contents are what remains when greed, theft, violence and occasional vindictiveness have done their work, but mitigated by an obstinate tradition of charity, tolerance and magnanimity, then perhaps it is, or one may hope that it is, indeed a mirror of England. <laughs>